Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We are here today to start talking about hybrid work. My name is Rare Bin Sohail from Innovate and I will be the moderator for today. Uh, we have an extremely stellar panel with us today and we're just gonna do a quick round of introductions. Japer, if you could introduce yourself. Hi everyone, um, Japer here. I'm actually from ESCO. So what ESCO actually does is that we are a uh, AV system integrator. So um, we basically create, um, what, what we actually do is that we actually uh, conceptualize the ideas that the client has for a specific uh, space and we actually bring it to life. Thank you, Japer. Tony, if you could introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. My name is Tony Sandberg and I'm working at the Barco as the Vice President for Sales for our learning and meeting experience solutions. Alison? Yes, hi everyone. My name is Alison. I am part of our outbound product management group at ServiceNow focused on our workplace service delivery product. And our product is really all about connecting your people and your places and creating great workplace experiences. Um, we have a whole suite of apps, but two that are kind of most notable in this uh, current kind of era of work would be reservation management and workplace indoor mapping. So glad to be here. Thanks. Last but not least, Petri, if you could introduce yourself. Petri for our Morto. Thanks very much, H. Petri Morto, so I'm Vice President for Sales and Marketing for APAC for Sennheiser. And those who don't know company, company called Sennheiser, we do make advanced audio technology that makes collaboration and learning easier for people. Excellent. Let's start to talk about hybrid work. Now, hybrid work is relatively new, right? We're all learning as we go along. We're all trying to figure out what best works for us, for our employees. Hybrid work might look very different for different companies and different people. So starting from the broad stroke, what can you do to start building a cohesive strategy for hybrid work? Uh, Japer, if you could start us off. Yeah, thank you, H. Uh, okay, so personally, what I feel is that, you know, the definition of hybrid working is really very different from different organizations. So I believe the first thing that you actually need to figure out is like, you know, what is the proper definition of hybrid working for your organization? Because the thing is that, um, you know, for maybe company A itself, um, it could be like, okay, I just need uh, some people in the office, some people not in the office and, and that kind of thing. You know, for someone else, it could be the uh, opportunity to actually have everyone basically working both online and offline. So I believe the thing is that, you know, um, how to actually kickstart this uh, process is actually to get feedbacks from your employees. And, you know, of course, over there, try to, um, you know, tweak it and tailor it according to the uh, surveys that you actually get. Because the thing is that a, a lot of uh, business owners as well as, you know, top management, they do put in their own personal feelings and sometimes that may not be the on-the-ground sentiment. So personally, I think that it's always good to have a very open communication, you know, trying to understand like what, it, what works for your organization and, you know, from there, just do the proper implementation that is required for your organization. So the idea is basically to just make everyone feel like, um, you know, that, they are there, even though they may not be physically there. So yeah, that's that from me. Alison, um, Japer mentioned a good first step is starting to talk to your employees and trying to figure out what hybrid work means for you. Uh, but is there something in the knowledge pool already, something that we know kind of just like broad stroke works and you can start down that track as the first building block for your strategy? Absolutely. So to build off that concept of kind of keeping your employees at the center of your strategy, um, I think what we all know right now is that hybrid work is about more than just being able to work from home. It's about that flexibility. And we know that 
flexibility means something very different from one employee to the next. So there's not really a one size fits all approach that you can kind of um, apply here. Um, and so one thing that I've seen very effective that our, a, lot of, a lot of our customers have been doing here is actually going through kind of a process to identify your different worker personas and then conducting fo focus group sessions. So actually collecting those different worker personas, getting them um, in some sort of setting to ask them questions and get that direct feedback. Because again, as Japer was just mentioning, it's not um, a one size fits all strategy that you can kind of apply here. The other thing that I'll point out about building an effective um, strategy around hybrid work that I think is very important right now is really thinking about how you can understand different work patterns and use data and technology to drive that. So this means kind of digging into the analytics around when employees are actually deciding to come in. So uh, looking at things like reservations, badge swipes, using things like sensors to, again, understand the habits of your workforce to help you more tactically build something that will realistically work for the schedules that you're seeing. Tony, the feedback from Japer and Allison seems to be data, 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 right? Just get more insight as the starting point. Um, where do you go with that data? Let's say I've collected all of it. I'm sitting in it. I've created my personas. What's the next step in kind of building a strategy for hybrid work? No, very good. And I think, uh, thanks, Alison and, and Japer. Uh, when, of course, we, when you have the data, and, and I'm sure you have a lot of data, we also have data that uh, we know that people want to, to, to work hybrid. We also know that a lot of hybrid meeting environments cause uh, stress for people. And, and of course, and what do you need to start to look into is how can you actually design your office and how do you want your office uh, in different meeting rooms? Do you want smaller uh, huddle rooms, pods? Um, do you need boardrooms or do you not need other collaboration areas? And then, of course, start to look into how can we use the technology here as the enable, enabler to reduce that stress that a lot of people today feel them when they are in a hybrid meeting. And this stress can be because of yeah, you need, you don't know how you're going to connect to the meeting room and you want to share presentations and so on and so forth. How do you actually use that workflow to start the meeting using your laptop, for instance, to make it easy for all the users, wherever they are, whether they're at home or whether they're in a collaboration space, in a small huddle room or in a board meeting. And that's really where, where technology can help to reduce the stress and actually make the meeting run much, much, much smoother. Petri, Tony just mentioned technology as an enabler for your hybrid workplace and your hybrid environments. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? What role does technology play and how should people view technology moving forward, seeing that we're in this hybrid world of hybrid work? Thanks very much. Yes, um, technology, of course, is, is key in today's world. And uh, I cannot, you know, <laughs> seriously re-emphasize more that it's vital that enterprises have to develop their own strategies for hybrid work. And, and, and you know, really, really saying that the, the own strategy is the key to all of the organizations as well. And of course, um, you know, thinking of the, uh, the starting points would be basically to talk to the employees, as, as we heard already, listening, and, um, you know, find out how the organization can aid in their productivity in, in considering the hybrid work for, for different organizations. Taking into consideration um, the inputs feedback from, from the employees that could serve as a guide for, for constant improvement, refinement of uh, best practices as well. So, um, and I think, you know, just so hybrid work is not just an HR policy. So it's, it's, it's much more um, that, you know, <clears throat> tools, technologies um, can enable hybrid work model ensure productivity, HR policy tools, technologies, IT, infrastructure, equally important. And that should always work hand in hand. That's, that's the way I envision the hybrid work now and in the future. Japer, you're obviously in direct communication with the people who are building hybrid work environments and they're building these spaces. Is that message resonating with the end user and the people who are in the offices, that message of technology needs to be an enabler. You've got to start thinking about technology more in terms of like a cohesive thing that fits in with everything else rather than just a silo. 
Yeah, for sure. So, um, okay, so this is what actually we are experiencing. So the thing is that because uh, a lot of people, they, they do know of like the different technologies that are out there and, and things like that. And, you know, as much as um, there's a lot of bells and whistles and things like that, uh, some of the equipments out there may not be very suitable for their organizations. And the thing is that, you know, as much as possible, of course, from a client's perspective, we definitely want to try to, you know, achieve whatever that they actually want. So I, I would say uh, the, the main thing is actually to really, you know, have um, devices, tools that would actually uh, enable them to use everything very easily. So what we actually want to do is that we give very great onboarding services. We need to say that because um, there are certain people, especially, you know, the older folks where they are a bit resistant to change, especially for like technologies and things like that. So how we try to actually do this is to, you know, we of course cater to the, um, this group of people as well. And the thing is that, um, you know, we don't want to really shock them and we want to show them like, hey, you know, by using this, this is actually going to enhance whatever that you are actually doing and it will actually help to improve the workflow and things like that. So um, I'm just going to take some examples. So, you know, we can talk about like the ceiling microphones, like, you know, what, what Sennheiser actually has, their TCC, the team uh, connect to, you know, of course the click share itself from Barco itself. And of course, you know, uh, from ServiceNow, they do have like the uh, meeting room bookings and things like that. So, I, I mean, these are things that, to be honest, if you look at it um, from a very overview, it looks very simple. You know, uh, it doesn't it doesn't really help much and things like that. But the thing is that in reality, when people actually use it, they start to appreciate like what this actually does, how this actually simplifies everything for them. So yeah, that's that's that for me. Um, Tony, Japer mentioned something really interesting, which is the resistance to adopting new technology, right? And the problem right now is technology has become so critical and so much new technology is streaming into the workspace. How do you start getting people to adopt things? Is it just a matter of you making your products easier and simpler and more intuitive? I definitely we have our part as technology vendors. We need to do friendly technology that is easy to use. We, 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 we cannot create too complicated solutions. So, so that of course is a very big part of it and also Yes, there are certain training as well involved for, for in the company, but uh, but yes, uh, I would say the user friendly technology is the key, and and we can just look at the different workflows. Say that you are in a, you are in the office. All of a sudden, you need to make a call. Do do, do you need to book a call, or do you need to put it in in your team's calendar, or other, no? A lot of times, you just need a, a space to go into, and then of course we need to have technology that you can easily style the person ad hoc and also then connect the video. And, and that is a technology that, that exists today that we design and solutions that just go in, connect to the meeting and you, and you can use your own laptop, but still you can use the video equipment and the audio equipment in the room. So, so that is one thing that we have looked at and to, to make it as easy as possible for people having a meeting, whether it's a scheduled meeting or whether it's, a, it's an ad hoc meeting. And, and we, of course, all know that uh, uh, that we have a lot of those today, both ad hoc and, and scheduled meetings. So the, 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 to, to summarize the question, yes, it needs to be user friendly. You need to listen to, to the customers. We know from um, Barco, uh, Barco surveys that 70, more than 70 percent of people wants to use the laptop to host a video conference. And that is quite striking. So how do we then as technology provider make that easy and, and, and make it uh, easy for the end user just connect the laptop and run the meeting from, from, from the laptop. Alison, in the context of the solutions that ServiceNow provides, uh, I'm sure you're seeing that people are now paying attention to these new workloads that they've never paid attention to before, right? Like room booking, uh, yes. desk booking, things like that. They weren't even on a lot of SMEs radars before. So how do you start that conversation and of getting these people who are completely brand new to these workflows and getting them onboarded and getting them feeling like they're proficient and that they can get what they need out of it? 
Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, in this new era of hybrid work, one of the first questions that our customers have is how do we even get started? Let's say we want to enact something like neighborhoods or hoteling, like how do we enable that from a technology perspective? And obviously that's inherent in the design of our applications, but what we're also seeing as kind of a trend right now with customers is this concept of piloting. So our customers have kind of large real estate footprints, but they're deciding to hone in potentially on one pilot location and roll out and use use that as kind of a learning that then is spread throughout the rest of their locations. So um, specifically with the kind of hot topic right now of hybrid work, the big thing that's popular from an implementation perspective for customers is reservation management and actually allowing employees to book spaces and enact that. And one of the powerful results of that that we're now seeing come to fruition is visibility into who else is on site for collaboration purposes. So let's say you now have visibility into the fact that your five coworkers are in the office this week and you actually want to book space near them. We're now kind of seeing that come to fruition, which is very powerful and gets our customers even more excited about kind of rolling this out to other locations. The other big trend that I'm seeing that is kind of emerging as an area of excitement within customers right now is this concept of mapping. So um, actually last year, uh, ServiceNow made an announcement that we were intending to acquire a third party mapping technology named Mapwise. And so actually just back on May 5th, uh, we announced that that was replatformed and now natively part of our suite of applications. So that's now kind of an added layer that our customers are working on implementing within reservation management, which is exciting. Patrick, when it comes to audio, it's almost like it needs to be invisible, right? The, the speakers and the microphones don't need to be present and yet they still need to perform at the highest levels. Um, it's a bit of a hard task to accomplish, but is that the trend that you see going forward where you have to do this, you have to be invisible and yet still perform at the highest level? Absolutely. Um, and, and of course, 77 years experience in a, in a company helps us to, to make, make beautiful, good, also invisible, touchless audio products uh, in, in the present time as well. But you know, um, to find Usually the right technologies to, to different uh, installations, we, we, we have to have a clear understanding of the use cases as well. Um, also, once again, listening to the customer, the needs, space requirements of, of the different users. And I think this, this, this was said as well already previously by, by other panelists that uh, you know, when we work in the hybrid model, uh, we should always reconsider the installation or the de deployments for the employees in the office and for the employees at home. And uh, of course, audio uh, has become extremely vital, especially during, during these years, because uh, we all know how many, how many meetings we have had. And if, if the audio quality is poor, then, then of course that's a, that's a meeting wasted or, or lecture wasted in, 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 as an example, in university space as well. So we have looked into, you know, making audio solutions. What you as well mentioned, um, you know, previously upper about the uh, the ceiling microphones, as an example, it's a good touchless audio solution for, for different meeting rooms as well. So, um, you know, true voice lift, advanced zone controls, all sorts of aspects brought in, into the product that um, is, is actually requested by our customers. So. So that is also something that has been um, a big thing uh, in, in, the, in the last two years, especially contactless audio, wireless conferencing solutions. So uh, reduces hygiene risks and, and clutter as well. And um, another thing that we have also seen um, as an example is, is our um, uh, one, one of our new products as well, which is called Team Connect Intelligent Speaker. So, so um, basically audio solution optimized for, for Microsoft Teams rooms um, and it allows team meetings to be smart, uh, focused, inclusive, and also changes a little bit of the way that teams can collaborate in hybrid meetings. So not going to all of the technical aspects, um, but one of the key things that uh, you know, we, we all know how painful it's, it's to, to you know, be the one who's writing meeting minutes for all those, all those team meetings. So, so now we have, um, you know, as an example in, in TCISP, we have uh, 
meeting transcribed in, in real time. So uh, identifying 10 different voices in the room by name uh, gives the remote hard of hearing participants also a seat at the table. So technology is, is driving us ahead. We have a question from our audience. And uh, the question is talking about including the home as part of the hybrid work strategy, right? It's not just the office. We have this remote location as well, or the far end. Um, the question is open to the panel if anyone wants to jump in and address it. I can jump in. Um, so one thing that I've been seeing with our customers in terms of addressing the home aspect is from a service offering perspective, um, offering work from home kits. And some of our customers have been labeling these in creative ways, such as home office in a box or office in a backpack. And it's being a little bit more proactive about sending employees the different tools and resources that they need at home to work effectively. Um, and I really love this because I think um, those of us who are employees working at home, we've been doing it for the past, however, like two years, and you don't think about how impactful it could be to get something new delivered to you that you hadn't even thought about. It could be as simple as having a whiteboard, or maybe it's a new um, webcam that makes you want to like turn your video on and be more collaborative. But that's one thing that I've been seeing our customers do to really incorporate that home aspect is being proactive and sending those tools directly to employees. Uh, excellent answer, Allison, and it kind of segues into the next topic of discussion, which is going to be around concrete tips. So let's say someone's already interviewed all their employees, sat down, built the personas, done their research, got their data, come up with some HR policies, and now they're ready to enact hybrid work, right? What are some of the tips that you guys have kind of seen work in your time in building these places and furnishing them? What, is, what are some things or some pitfalls that you think that they can really easily avoid? Um, Chaper, if you could start us off. Yeah, sure. So um, I will actually be covering not only like um, whatever that's happening over uh, right now, I will also be covering things like uh, what I think future trends would actually be like. So, okay, let's talk about now. So the thing is that right now, uh, personally, what I feel, especially if you're comparing a like, home usage as well as an office usage is that typically organizations actually invest more in the office usage and things like that. And the home usage, honestly speaking, is something that is very lacking. So uh, personally, what I would actually recommend to um, you know, the listeners out there is that for a home usage, two things are very, very important. First thing is audio. The thing is that um, video is not really that important. Reason being is that because you need to be heard. You want people to hear you. And, and things like that. But the thing is that it doesn't really matter whether they can actually see you because the main thing is like how you communicate with people is via audio. So make sure your audio is great. Of course, internet connection is another factor as well because um, you know running a lot of stuff, eating up the bandwidth and things like that would actually affect your video conferencing uh, experience as well. So do keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, I, I mean, um, if you're talking about maybe future tech and things like that, personally, I feel that uh, VR, VR is definitely something that is really expanding quite a fair bit. And uh, in fact, if you look at Facebook, now known as Meta, they are really uh, investing heavily on that space. So uh, in fact, they bought a uh, this hardware company called Oculus. So uh, they have actually rebranded it to Meta as well. And um, I think what's going to happen is that because the, the reason why VR is not as popular as it should be is that I believe it's because of two, two reasons. One is the affordability. So right now it's still, I wouldn't say it's super expensive, but it's definitely not something where, you know, it's like spare change that, that you spend on. You have to really want to commit to it to actually purchase it. The second thing is the, you know, how comfortable it is. Because imagine wearing something heavy on your head for long hours definitely is going to be very painful for you. So the thing is that, you know, another thing that um, this would be slightly off whatever that we're talking about, but I mean, it's booming as well as, you know, the crypto market itself. Everyone is very crazy about it and things like that. And, you know, who knows? Right now, everyone is talking about virtual land spaces. I believe you've seen big organizations purchasing land on virtual lands itself. So who knows? Maybe in the future, your office space is not a physical space, but it could be even a virtual space as well. So yeah, I mean, you know, eventually the future will become like, 
if you watch Back to the Future, you know, it could be that future that they envision happening. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Petri, you've mentioned that audio is very important. Japer started his conversation off by illustrating the importance of audio as well. Any tips or tricks to get good audio right from the start? I know it's a very complex problem mm -hmm. to solve, right? But something that will help our audience kind of go like, hey, at least we're starting off on the right track. Yeah, um, I mean, um, of, of course, you know, what I mentioned as well, and, and what was mentioned already previously by, by the other participants here, this that audio plays a very important role. And uh, I, I would like to touch a point, point that Chapper actually mentioned about um, kind of replicating the office in the future, because, um, you know, we can also expect that the physical offices are moving into the metaverse. So companies that we see now creating digital twins to their offices, so attracting actually the best talent anywhere in the world. And that's that's been the development now, now in the last years. Um, just reading, reading, reading some of the articles about, as an example, Art Accenture, they built a virtual campus called the Nth Floor as well for people to uh, you know, meet, collaborate, and learn, uh, whether it's for, for meeting and socializing, it's kind of a scalable solution um, that can, can bring people around the world together as well. Zoom that we're utilizing today also recently announced that um, metaverse-like qualities will be integrated uh, into this app known as Velo. So we can uh, actually use, use these within the calls to recreate the, uh, the physical space in the digital sphere as well. So um, it's going to be very interesting um, to see various business applications, um, especially in the virtual reality platform, reimagined offices, meeting rooms uh, in, the, in the metaverse as well. So of course, coming back to, back to your question about the audio and the importance of it, yes, yes, we are, um, you know, um, keeping close eye on the developments uh, of the metaverse space. And uh, of course, being one of the uh, leading uh, manufacturer of audio solutions in this world, um, we want to stay on the edge of uh, innovation as well. Tony, uh, tech tips on how to handle the hybrid work and maybe the transition from physical to digital. Yes, so a few tech tips, and I mentioned a few already, but I mean, we do focus a lot at Barker. We do focus uh, on, and again, technology should really be the enable, not the stopper. So, so that, that, that's really the focus. And um, my tech tips would, would, of course, be to yeah, continue them to make it easy. As I mentioned, that wherever you go in, in the office or where you're using the at home, that uh, you have the same kind of user experience, meaning that you can use your laptop you can walk into a meeting space or whatever and and then uh, whatever room and and then connect wirelessly directly and just connect uh, to, to a video conferencing with that audio and and video that we already talked about uh, and uh, also then if we look into new tech spaces what we have seen is uh, yes you you have video enabled spaces but what we also see in a trend now is that you have the corporate studios so a lot of times now you, you see that we have town halls, every company has had town halls. Yes, in the past, it was maybe a little bit tricky. You have a green screen technology. What we do see now is more like a broadcast. You have large uh, video or LED screens in the background, and you then uh, talk to the employees and, and to the company, uh, easy then connecting again, just using your, your laptop wirelessly, and you can walk around and have that town hall showing all your presentations in the background. So I would say that's a quite, you know, maybe not metaverse yet, but it's definitely something that you can deploy today and, and that, you can, uh, that you can use when you have town halls or all hands meetings in, in, in your companies. And um, Alison, um, there's a question from our chat, uh, which is very relevant to the things that we're talking about. It is talking about getting a single pane of glass or a single window frame to kind of manage everyone that's coming into the office and everyone that's that's uh, around in the space and everyone that's not around in the space. Um, any tips on how we can start to go towards this one singular platform that just encompasses everything that needs to be done in the hybrid work environment? 
Yes, it's almost as if this question was written for um, ServiceNow. We like to call ourselves the platform of platforms and one of our big strategies, um, I like to, to call it, we, we want to make as many friends on the playground as possible. But what that means is that we have a very strong integration strategy. So we know that there are a lot of platforms and tools that are kind of relevant in this current time. Um, but what ServiceNow is focused on is helping bring all of that together for both workplace or facilities teams, but also employees. Uh, and additionally, what we do is oftentimes take that data and we have a lot of dashboards and tools that can be kind of used to, to visualize that in one um, space. And so just to give one example, we have um, right now a lot of questions from customers on how do I actually think about things like utilization and how my space is being used. And so we have purpose-built dashboards that kind of help view all of that in one central location. So great question. One of the things that everyone kind of jumped on during this discussion right now was was VR, right? This this metaverse, this kind of like digital realm, which is now intersecting with our physical. I mean, technically, we're all in the digital world right now, even though we're all in separate physical locations. Um, Hybrid work is really being envisioned as, as a transformation of spaces, right? People are just going like, hey, I need to transform my meeting room. I need to transform my boardroom. I want to bring the conversation to new spaces, right? Be it digi dig digital or physical, right? The office has, uh, has always been like a lobby, a pantry, some desks, some meeting rooms, some boardrooms. Are we going to start seeing new physical spaces emerge as well that are going to become part of the office um, and number two is the the virtual being incorporated um, are they kind of adding that to their office space here in asia pacific um, japer those two questions over to you sure okay so um to answer your first question i would say that you know, as you look at how the workspace has actually changed over the years. So, you know, let's think about maybe 10 years back. 10 years back itself, an office is very, very straightforward. It's a reception, you know, then you have all the different meeting rooms, the cubicles and things like that. So after that, I would say, you know, uh, maybe five years back, they removed the cubicles basically to make it like an open office concept and things like that. So I would say along the years, you know, definitely there will be transformation and things like that. And um, how I actually envision, um, you know, the next office spaces would be is that there is still a certain layer of privacy, as you can see from like, I, I believe you have seen uh, booths where, you know, um, if you need to take phone booths and, and things like that, where you can actually just hop in, you know, uh, but the thing is that it's still a very open, cohesive environment kind of, uh, you know, office spaces. So, and uh, Google themselves, they actually uh, practice this thing called the campfire. So, uh, what, what actually happens is that they actually have like a semicircle uh, seat, seating arrangement. And, you know, there's of course like the screens on the other side. So, it seems like, you know, all of you are actually sitting in a circle, even though they may not be physically there. So, that's how I actually see, you know, the offices uh, going forward. Uh, okay, regarding... Your, your second question itself, um, how would virtual actually mix with uh, physical? So the thing is that right now, um, you know, because of COVID itself, I, I would say this actually accelerated the, uh, you know, the digital and physical space itself. The lines has been very blurred. And uh, a lot of people are now more comfortable you know, being uh, on a virtual call, like what, what we are doing right now, as compared to, you know, if you talk about uh, before the pandemic started. So, so the thing is that how, how I see things are going uh, forward is that definitely it would be much, much more easier. And um, definitely, uh, you know, that there will be more softwares and, and, and things like that that will help enable, you know, people to reach out better, to collaborate better. So, I mean, you see, for example, for Zoom itself, they just released their whiteboard functionality itself. This actually helps to collaborate more as compared to in the past. Because in the past, what you need to do is like you need to have a separate camera on a whiteboard and things like that. Yeah, but the thing is that now they actually integrated it. So, uh, I, I can't really say, you know, from the software perspective, like what's going to happen next. But how I see it is that basically the lines are going to be even more and you know uh, it comes to the topic of the VR which uh, I was speaking about just now as well so yeah 
Tony, you mentioned a little bit about corporate town halls, right? And we are seeing these places completely change from the town hall that we know to a yeah. completely different new thing. Uh, maybe you can expand a bit more about what's happening and what the new town hall is going to be. Yes, thank you. So yes, uh, of course. Uh, so the new town hall is that you want to have, or you always have both than the physical and the virtual participants. So that's how you today, you have maybe 50, 60, 70% in, in the room, or if you're in MNC, that you have all the, the, the people across the world. You will still have a lot of people inside the room where you're actually standing talking. And they need to see then, of course, the presentations on the screens and what's behind you. And now with the technology, you can actually do that virtually as well. So the people that also joins across uh, the world or not in physical in the office can um, can also have the same experience. Then. So it becomes almost like a broadcast for, for them. In, in and, and I think we've all been in a lot of meetings where you can't really see the presenter or you can not, not do the presentation. But that that is something that we see today that our technology helps to. And it's also about you have a lot of um, physical places that you need to have that hybrid that is also training environments where you maybe have half of the class in the room and you also have then students or, or uh, employees that are joining that training class you still need to have that ability to for the trainer to do and walk around and do that teaching uh, and, and still feel like he's teaching instead of focusing on the technology. So that's an, an, another environment where we see that the technology now has uh, really helped to, to do those uh, hybrid training classes. And also there are these control rooms, well, we talked about more boardrooms, uh, huddle space and so on and so forth, where you might have, yeah, uh, both people sitting or walking around, but also joining from, from a broad, uh, from, Petri, um, your thoughts on new spaces that are kind of popping up, new ideas that are being implemented both in physical and mm. digital? Yeah, I think we, we already uh, opened up the topic of, uh, of virtual reality, but of course, um, also not to, not to forget the, um, the existing office space as well. What Tony mentioned as well, that the, uh, the feeling of reality also, you know, in in, in collaboration, it's, it's, it's becoming more and more important. And I think we're heading into that direction as well with audio, with video, with uh, VR, with metaverse. So, so we feel like uh, we're getting closer. So it's not that long in the distance, uh, 2050 future, future plans of, of companies and, and individuals as well. Um, of course, um, we always want to, want to emphasize um, and listen to the feedback from from everyone who who utilizes our solutions, uh, that it must be user friendly. So so it must be very easy to use, because um, what we have realized in, in in the last two years, hybrid work is here to stay. Okay, it's 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 not gonna suddenly go away. Um, this this is the new new world we're living in in now. <clears throat> so you know. For, for the future meeting rooms, so of course, there's also examples mentioned about the um, um, kind of replicating the, uh, the physical meeting rooms into, into um, metaverse meeting rooms. Um, so, so it enables companies to attract the talent um, anywhere in the world. I think that's, that's one of the key, uh, key things also that has arisen from, from, from the pandemic world, but also Another good example is that we've seen now more and more these um, kind of events, hotels. Um, I think it was mentioned also, also these uh, like a green screen um, studios where you host virtual town hall meetings and everything. So, so it also changes um, uh, the workplaces because you can, you can have um, bigger company meetings. You can, you can rent the space for, for one, um, one day as an example, host your town hall, host your kickoff also from there. But um, it has to be set up in a way that it's actually going to be user friendly and as real life as possible. And Alison, what do we do with this merging? Right? It's it's yep. to me, it's almost like you know the kind of service suite that you guys are providing is trying to bring 
that kind of like virtual element of every, I know who's here, I know everyone, I know where they're at, right? You're trying to port that over into the physical world, <laughs> kind of. Yep. I might be off base, but what do no. you think of no, that's that's correct. And I, so what we're seeing right now is the workplace is shifting from being a place of habit to a place of purpose. So kind of piggybacking off of what we've been discussing, we're seeing a lot more events. And with these events, my prediction is that we're going to have a lot more space that's more modular and flexible. Um, so maybe early in the week, this space is serving as an event location. There's a big gathering. Um, there's an event where employees are kind of collaborating. But then later in the week, maybe that morphs back to being kind of a coffee collaboration spot. Um, and so space essentially will be more dynamic and it needs to be very adjustable based on these employee needs that are very specific and evolving. And so specifically from a product perspective where um, workplace service delivery comes in in that conversation is really providing your employees the ability to make these requests on behalf of their facility or workplace teams. So you as an employee would be able to go in and say, hey, I need to make a reservation. Here are my attendees. This is the configuration of the, the space that we need. We need to add on catering. So it's really kind of streamlining all of that and bringing um, that together and making it easy and frictionless for the employee. Again, needing that space to evolve from uh, the, the early week use case of the event space to maybe the collaboration space. Excellent. Um, we're gonna open the discussion up for Q and A's from the audience. I've already tried and incorporated some of the questions that they've put forward. And uh, if you have any other burning questions, now would be the time to ask them. Uh, while we wait, there's something that I kind of want to touch on, uh, and that is collaboration. Now, Japer mentioned, you know, the platforms are doing a little bit extra in terms of collaboration. Zooms introduced whiteboards and all these things, but. The studies still show that collaboration over virtual is not as good as collaboration in person. And to be honest, right, other than meeting your colleagues, collaboration in person seems to be the biggest or the second biggest draw to the office, right? I want to go to the office because I want to collaborate in person. Now, I want everyone on the panel to kind of go like, hey, no, collaboration in person is always going to be better, and this is why, or you could take the other stance of, no, collaboration on virtual can be improved, but we need to do X, Y, Z. Uh, Tony, let's start with you. It's a very challenging question, but uh, I would say, yes, collaboration in person probably always will be, but the second best thing and we need that second best thing because we cannot always be in the same room. The second best thing is really to use and the technology as enabled to create that collaboration uh, that uh, that you really need. And of course, we, 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 we can't, I mean, we can't fly people around the world every time. You cannot go in because of other reasons. And of course, you have people who wants to, to move, uh, not going into the office. So there I would say, use the collaboration tools and the technology that exists to, do, to, to make that those meetings really become collaborative meetings. Uh, Japer, this is probably something that is posed to you by, by clients, right? They're probably yeah. asking, hey, I want virtual collaboration to be better. Do you think the tools are out there are, or, or are you still waiting for better tools to come by your way to improve virtual collaboration? Uh, okay, so... I agree, Tony, that definitely, you know, um, the technologies and things like that definitely would have to eventually reach that stage. And the thing is that, you know, a physical kind of experience can never be really replicated 100%, to be honest. So the thing is that I, I'm not saying that there are no technologies, there are no uh, equipments that enable that. Currently, there are, but the thing is that, I, I mean, you know, as how technology actually evolves, Let's just look back at maybe 15 years ago, would you be holding a smartphone? I believe you're most likely holding like a Nokia, you know, a Motorola and things like that. But you, 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 look, you look at how, how things are right now, you know, Apple actually revolutionized the smartphone uh, industry itself. So what, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, it, it, it's hard to say because now there's too many new technologies are coming out and, you know, just like, just so happened that 
this particular technology is really so good and you know it becomes mainstream. I, I, I mean, frankly speaking, before pandemic, to be frank, uh, VC is not something that is very popularly used. You, you see uh, Microsoft Teams Room, uh, Skype, uh, Zoom, for example, they have been around for, for the longest time. But the thing is that, you know, people only see the value in it after the pandemic actually happened. So what I'm trying to say is that there are current technologies that can, you know, enable that kind of experience, you know, to give it a much more closer to physical experience kind of collaboration. But the thing is that, I mean, nothing mainstream has been confirmed yet. But who knows, six months from now, two years from now, even five years from now, something will just come out and boom, you know, it's just right in your face. Yeah. Petri, can we expect that something that's going to go boom from Sennheiser? Uh, can you hear some secrets with us? Your secret roadmap. No, no I would love to, Ish, and, and, and everybody joining 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 today but um but of course we're we're closely monitoring uh all, all the innovative technologies we want to be in forefront in in the innovative technologies as well um you know doing 3d virtual reality everything that relates to 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 audio in in in, in metaverse in 3d you know you name it it's it's uh, it's something that we want to put a high focus on but but actually I, I was just um, listening that it's it's a really tough question that you that you asked about you know um, in person meeting or or hybrid meeting I I, I would say actually that it goes in hand in hand because uh, seeing now um, after you know let's say let's say that the pandemic has eased a little bit um, meeting people face to face and then um, from that point onwards collaborating in a hybrid world is so much more better. Than, than than previously. So so if we utilize both um, platforms in the right way, I think um, they they will exist together. And Alison, same question over to you. In person collaboration, or do you feel that collaboration on digital has gotten there? I think it entirely depends on the type of collaboration that's needed. But if I had to make a blanket statement, I would say that in-person is currently better um, for a multitude of reasons, but I do agree that there are different things happening with technology being an enabler that eventually we may see virtual catch up. Um, and the other thing that I would point out that's interesting, just to kind of flip the perspective, I think technology is a big enabler here, but if I think about why virtual um, is maybe not as effective as in person, it's because we're very prone to distractions when we're virtual, right? So we may be at home, we may have things that are happening, kids running around in the background, we may be getting instant messages, emails. So I think part of this is also inherently in kind of the change management that your organization is applying in terms of expectations with virtual meetings. So I think that's the other angle that maybe needs to catch up is almost like this reset of expectations when you are in a virtual environment and kind of tuning into the meeting and trying to hone out of what's going on in your in your home. Tony, uh, the studies show that one of the things in addition to distractions and, and not being focused, one of the things that really gets people not collaborating as well on digital is you miss out on a lot of cues like physical cues that you would just subconsciously pick up. And that to me seems like a problem of far end representation. It's like if the person's a tiny little box on your screen, obviously you're yes. going to miss, miss the physical cues, right? Yes. But it's, it's a complex problem as well, right? Because maybe the other person doesn't have good internet. Maybe they don't have the best setup. Maybe they're logging in from, from a laptop. I know you can solve the the in-room problem of representing far end, right? But could you expand on that and maybe touch a little bit on how you can actually make the remote location a bit better as well? Yes, so, so we, we're really talking about the, the stress of the meeting equity that we, we, we call it that. Yes, how do you feel, how do you make people sitting remotely feeling a, a, feeling a part of the meeting? And uh, the, yes, you mentioned already, you, you can set up the room, of course, and there are different ways of doing that, that, uh, that uh, yes, the persons are actually easily seen. And that's a lot, uh, I, I think Jay probably knows it's quite as well as when you actually design the room, 
you can see a lot of good examples where you make the meeting equity much, much, much better than if you, for instance, to maybe have the screen, some people sitting and watching like this, it's very, very difficult for, for that person to, um, to, to actually be, feel as a part of it. Uh, the other one is already mentioned, the audio is extremely important. Uh, and of course, video is equally important if you should have that meeting equity. So, so I would say those two things uh, plays a big part there. And then uh, again, one thing that uh, we, we talked about is, is the ease of use. So, and, and, and we know in the studies that a lot of people feel stressed whether they are in the room or where they dial in. Here again comes and it should be easy for, for the remote person to join and be a part of the meeting and also sharing if, if they want to run the meeting from their laptop as, or as it was in the meeting room. And also another thing is that you can, for instance, have dual, uh, dual sharing. Uh, a lot of times you don't see, uh, you don't see, for instance, two present presentations and also what Barco, for instance, do. We also have a conferencing view now. So when you, when you see and share content, uh, we all know that, uh, uh, that, for instance, teams, you disappear, but now you can actually see that conference panels. So we're doing a lot of innovation there in order to make sure that the persons that are from home doesn't feel like they're not a part of the meeting. And we will round this conversation out with a question from the audience. So the question from the audience is whether our panels think there's going to be one company that's going to dominate the service provision moving forward. Um, I kind of want to reframe that a little bit, right? Over the pandemic, we've seen extremely great growth from a couple of players, right? Zoom, Microsoft Teams, they, they come to mind, right? These are people who were there, they had a solution that everyone wanted, right? And they experienced growth. We're kind of moving out of the pandemic, but we're still in that weird time period of everything changing, right? Which means that there is an opportunity for someone else to step up with the right solution, provide it to the market in an easy to use manner and experience great growth. Um, I think the question at the end of the day would be, is there someone you think is poised and in that position to grow right now in the market? I know we've thrown around names like Metaverse and a lot more, but we'll just quickly go around and kind of see what everyone thinks. Um, Japer, if you could start us off. Yeah, sure. So um, what, what I can say is that it's really hard to you know, pinpoint a name, uh, you know, a specific organization and things like that. But what I, I can say is that you know, definitely Microsoft itself, uh, Zoom, they have the right idea you know, and, and they are really like creating stuff and things like that. So I'll, I'll say other people, other organizations that um, you know, may not be at the back of mind for people would be people, uh, organizations like maybe Google and even Meta itself. Because uh, I mean, frankly speaking, they are more of like a social um, you know, dominated company. So they have a lot of uh, data and everything you know, with like how people um, do um, certain habits and, and things like that. So how, how I actually see it is that you know, it's, it's really hard to say you know, like, like what I mentioned previously in the previous question as well, is like things change really rapidly right now. So what may hold true now may not hold true in a week's time or a month's time or, you know, uh, one, one year, two years down the road. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, that's my thought. Petri, your thoughts on any particular service or solution that you feel is going to be a growth sector moving forward? It is tough to pick the racehorse um, at this time, but Chapper also also said and, and explained about the you know the big players that there are at the moment. Um, we we can see Google, we can see Meta, we can see Zoom, we can see um, companies that we rarely talk about here. But Tencent, uh, their meeting solutions coming from China, from other markets. There's multiple players. But one thing one thing you know, reminding where innovation usually comes from. Uh, it comes outside of the existing industry. 
So, so usually the one who comes up with the innovation comes from somewhere elsewhere. Like with the Nokia example, Apple did come from, from a different direction and, and took it over. So expect the unexpected to happen <laughs> in the future. Um, Alison, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm going to repeat that mantra of expect the unexpected. I, I am thinking under that same philosophy. And the other thing that I'll add to this is I think all of the kind of players in this space have learned a lot over the past two years on how fast they need to move. Um, and even internally at ServiceNow, during the peak of the pandemic, we were doing releases every two weeks because we realized that's just what we had to do to keep up with demands. And so now that we've kind of set this precedent, I feel like there's going to be a couple of new surprising large players emerge. And I feel like that's gonna be a constant kind of continual um, pattern of competition and growth just because that's the new standard is light speed. And lastly, Tony, same question over to you. Do you see any great big disruptor on the horizon or do you think the established industry, Google, Meta, Zoom, Microsoft, they're just gonna just become better and better and better? Yeah, I'm gonna be as diplomatic as the others and not really point out uh, anything. But of course, yes, you have the big ones and, uh, but uh, the disruptors have shown in the history that uh, that they can come very quickly. I mean, what well, for one thing that I believe all of us are sure of is that yeah, the the video conferencing and audio it it will just continue to be a part of all the meetings and it will also continue to be better and better. You come going to add all those collaboration uh, tools. You're also going to get closer as close as you can to the physical meeting and maybe we will get there one day. Uh, but but also then uh, what we at Park, we look a lot of this that we focus a lot of the agnostic, the agnostic because of these reasons. Whatever platform or technology in your future, you should still be able to then use uh, the, the the enhancement that we brings to to the video conferencing. So yes, I am as diplomatic. I'm not going to point out <laughs> any, but of course the big ones will be there for some time. But do expect there will be unexpected players as well coming coming along. Panelists, thank you so much for your time. We are at the end of this webinar. Um, audience, thank you so much for joining us. If you stick around for about two more minutes, uh, we're gonna put up the link for the webinar survey, which if you enter and complete, you have a chance to win some gifts. And we will also be providing you with some resources to kind of start your hybrid work journey as well. Uh, once again, panelists, thank you so much for your time and audience, thank you so much for joining us today. We also have a short assessment for you to figure out how ready you are for hybrid work. Now, this assessment covers a lot of different areas from employees and policy to workspaces, meeting rooms, home offices, corporate learning and development, and a lot of other topics. The URL is on your screen right now. And if you want, you can take this assessment as well to figure out your readiness for hybrid work. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you got both the QR code for the webinar survey and the link to the Barco assessment to help you with your hybrid work journey. With this, the webinar is over and I hope to see you for our next one. Thank you so much. Yeah.